Kepler okay. Well, we'll Ming, and he's going to tell us about generalized Kepler problems. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, uh, what, what I'm going to report is a uh, discovery about the Kepler problem and, and uh, Euclidean Jordan algebra. The two things are similar and related, but actually they are deeply related. I, okay. Um, so I will start with uh, a general remark. Uh, say for any, any elegant example, we wish to find a theory behind it and understand why it exists in the first place. Of course, these two issues are related. And finally, we want to explore the consequence in math and the physics. And I would argue that in this talk, that the Kepler problem serves as a, a elegant example, such an elegant example. Here's my talk plan. First, I will introduce the Kepler problem. So, uh, those are the important names associated to this problem. So, uh, Newton, of course, I, I think most of you know some history about it. So, Newton introduced this problem classically, and Schrodinger introduced this problem quantum mechanically. And uh, Laplace, Runge, and Lenz, they discover uh, the extra large symmetry called Lenz vector nowadays. And the Pauli and the use this uh, extra large symmetry to solve the quantum mechanical problem uh, algebraically. And the fork made the, uh, the symmetry uh, more explicit. And those two, two physicists, they discovered something new. Namely, uh, this Schrodinger problem has to do with the, the conformal group of our, our Minkowski space-time, SO24, okay. a kind of a mystery. Um, next, I will talk about uh, the general Kepler problem in its early period. So those are the important names associated to it. And then I switch the gears and to talk about something similarly unrelated, namely the Euclidean Jordan algebra. And those are the important names associated to it, and von Neumann was uh, a faculty here. And finally, with this uh, Jordan algebra introduced, I can talk about the general the Kepler problem in the most general fashion. OK, uh, let me talk about the Kepler problem first. So as you know, the Kepler problem is a physical problem about two bodies which attract each other by force obeying the inverse square law. And uh, the two bodies could be either the sun and a planet or the nucleus and the electron for the hydrogen atom, the simplest atom we have. By the way, the two body problem can be reduced to the one body problem, so essentially the one body problem. And there are three uh, main mathematical aspects. The first one is a classical dynamics problem. And the next one is a quantum bound state problem. The third one is a quantum scattering problem. Um, for the classical uh, dynamical problem, the main mathematical concern is the description of trajectories as algebraic curves. And it is easy to show that a Kepler orbit is a conic. So by Kepler Orbit, I really mean a non-colliding trajectory. The two bodies could, could collide each other. That kind of trajectory, I'm not interested in. So I'm interested in the Kepler orbit. Okay. Uh, so here is the picture. Uh, if the energy of the system is less than zero, you have bound orbit. That uh, is an ellipse. Uh, this is the sun. Okay. Roughly the sun. Okay. Should be the center of the mass. Okay. And if the energy equal to zero, then you get this. Uh, parabolic orbit. If energy is bigger than zero, you get this hyperbolic orbit. So in any case, you have a conic. But you have a descri different description in, in the three different cases. And to find it, so here is a, a short demonstration, which should appear in the math textbook. Uh, to find the orbit, we start with this equation motion. So this is really F. This is a force, gravitational force. This is MA. So I'm doing mathematics. So I said all the physical constant equal to 1. Okay. And then we observe that angular momentum is conserved. It means independent of time t. Uh, for actually, for any central force, here is not necessarily 3. This is always conserved. But what's amazing about this uh, central uh, uh, inverse square law is you have additional conserved quantity, namely this A vector. This L cross product with uh, 
uh, linear momentum, but mass is a one, so it becomes a velocity, plus the unit vector of the position vector r. So r is the position vector, and, and this r, scale r, is the length of the unit of, uh, of the position vector. Okay. Um, it's just a simple computation. You take a derivative of that, then this is a constant basis, double derivative here, double derivative here can be replaced by this, and then take a derivative there. Then you compute, it becomes zero. Okay. So as, as a consequence, um, we can derive the orbit very quickly. So you, you take a dot product with R, start from here, take a dot product with R. Since R, um, uh, A is a constant, so it's a length I call it A. Okay. And suppose the angle between R vector and A vector is a theta, then R dot A would be this. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if you take, dot, take this side dot with R, like this unit vector dot with R is just a length of R, and here you have that. Then this is a triple product, you do cyclic permutation, and then you, you end up with L squared. L squared means L dot with L. Okay? And this R here, this R here, the algebraically, you can easily solve, you get this. And this is really the uh, um, conic uh, written in the polar coordinates on the plane. Okay? In the case A equal to zero, this is R equal to constant. By the way, for the Kepler orbit, uh, non colliding trajectory, this L is never zero. Okay? So if A equal to zero, this is R equals constant, you get a circle. In general, A between zero and the less than one, you get an ellipse. A equal to one, you get uh, something called um, parabolic. And A bigger than one, you get a hyperbolic orbit. Okay? Uh, there's another observation I want to make, namely, uh, uh, look at it here. If, you, if we understand the meaning of cross product, then we know immediately we know this R vector is perpendicular to L. But since L is a constant, so R is perpendicular to it, so R is really on the plane perpendicular to L. So trajectory is a plane uh, 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 curve. Okay? And another fact is this L and A are perpendicular to each other. Uh, in fact, each term is perpendicular to L, uh, because this L cross R prime is perpendicular to L, and here this R is perpendicular to L. Okay, so A dot L equal to zero. And this absolute, uh, the length of A is really the eccentricity. And then what's the direction? Well, it's, uh, for, for the conic, you have two focus, and you draw a line segment from one focus to another focus, and you get a line segment, and this A vector is a parallel to it. Okay, so you would say, uh, we would say this A vector is an eccentricity vector. Okay, so A and L are perpendicular, and A is the eccentricity uh, vector. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about the hidden symmetry. Uh, there's an obvious uh, SO3 symmetry because of the central force, and uh, in, uh, uh, there's a something called Nether theorem which say whenever you have symmetry, you have conserved quantity, and vice versa. And here you have the uh, L is the angular momentum, it has three components. It, it, it will be the generator of this SO3. SO3 is a three-dimensional Lie group. And then you have the actual symmetry is SO4 because we have both L and A conserved. So A has three components, L has three components, altogether six components. And the SO4 it locally is a two copy of, well, condition product of two copy of SO3. So it's a six-dimensional. So here, exactly six, okay? And this system is uh, people call super integrable in the sense that the number of uh, functional independent conserved quantity is bigger than the degree of freedom. In this problem, the degree of freedom is three, but the number of independent of conserved quantity is, uh, is five. Because three from L, three from A, but, but you have to subtract one because L dot A equal to zero. That's one constraint. We have, we have to subtract that condition. So phi greater than one. Okay, super integrable. Now um, let's go to the quantum bound state problem. And here are the main mathematic concerns. The first, we need to determine the bound state uh, energy spectrum. And the next question is to describe the corresponding energy eigenspace as a representation of this SO4 group. And finally, uh, there is something called a Hilbert space bound state. Namely, you have you have lots of energy eigenspace. You take a direct sum of them, then you take a L2 completion of it, you get a Hilbert space. That Hilbert space is called Hilbert space bound state. And that thing turned out to be uh, 
unitary lowest weight representation of this SO24. And that thing is a dis this is a discovery of Planet and Beirut in the, in the 60s. Now here's the answer to this three question. The bound state energy spectrum is a negative one over two n squared. Here n <coughs> is a natural number, runs through all natural numbers. And the n's energy eigenspace is a tensor product of two identical copies of the n-dimensional irreducible representation of SO3. Remember I said that the SO4 is a locally isomorphic two copy of SO3. Okay, the irreducible representation of SO4 would be tensor product of two, two irreducible representation of SO3. But then remember there's a condition A dot L should be zero. And that condition really says the two copies of SO3 irreducible representation should be the same. So it has to be identical. So as a consequence, the, the dimension of this n's energy eigenspace is really n times n, which is n squared. In particular, n equal to 1, it's uh, just 1. So it's non-degenerate. The ground state is non-degenerate. Now, as a representation of SO2, 4, the Hilbert space bound state is a minimum and off-scale type. So what do I mean by the minimum? Uh, in representation theory, people know that this, is a, this representation is associated with the orbit. And this is a core joint orbit. This core joint orbit has the smallest positive dimension. And what do I mean by scalar type? Uh, in terms of physics languages, that means the the, the ground state is a non-degenerate, okay? not high dimensional. High dimensional is called a vector type. Now, the quantum mechanics, the mass model is that in quantum mechanics, we promote all physical observable to Hermitian operators. So in particular, the energy will be promoted to Hamiltonian operators, so this one. So this first part is the kinetic energy. The second part is the potential energy. So a, this delta is a Laplace operator. And what do you mean by bound state energy spectrum? Well, first of all, it's a real number lambda, such that this equation is true. Uh, this equation has a non-trivial square integrable solution. Non-trivial means not identical zero. Square integral means uh, uh, the integration, the take absolute value square of this integrate against the Lebesgue mirror over the whole R3 should be finite, okay, square integral. Uh, if you pick a random lambda, <coughs> The only solution you have, uh, non uh, square integral solution you have is zero, is a trivial one. Okay, so the lambda has to be a special one. And the quantum scattering problem, the main concern is to determine the scattering amplitudes as more meromorphic function of energy. I, I won't talk much about it. Uh, by the way, this is also related <coughs> to the bound state uh, spectrum problem uh, because this uh, meromorphic function has poles, the poles exactly at the bound state spectrum. Um, now, uh, we'll talk about the general the capital problem in its early period. As with many elegant examples in mathematics, one naturally wonders whether the beautiful capital problem is an isolated problem or not. It turns out the capital problem has a vast generalization, just as the order number has a vast generalization. And uh, here is a prehistory. Uh, first, there is everyone's generalization. You re we replace R3 minus the origin by r to the n minus origin, while still assuming the inverse square law. Then the system is still super integrable. But there is an interesting one, which is non-trivial to me. Uh, that is uh, by adding magnetic charge. And those two independent groups discover this toward the end of the 60s. So basically say, uh, if I use a hydrogen atom as a model, so the nucleus, uh, you assume it's a dying. I mean, carry both electric charge and magnetic charge. Origin in the real physics, uh, the hydrogen atom uh, just carry electric charge, uh, magnetic neutral. But hypothetically, we're doing mathematics. We're hypothetically, suppose they carry both magnetic charge and, uh, and uh, electric charge. So it's called dying. dying. But, but then, uh, uh, so called the scale, we have the scale potential come in to the picture, uh, into the Laplace operator. And uh, 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 the, the vector potential okay, come into the uh, um, Laplace operator. But at the same time, we have to adjust the scalar potential like this. This is the inverse square law. We have to adjust um, this to that, OK? And here, mu is, must be a half integer. And this is a magnetic charge. There's a drug quantization tells you it has to be like that. And there's a topological reason, because it's a twice of mu is the first term number, so it has to be integer. Uh, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the extra part. Yeah. Uh, we can find this by, uh, well, one way to do it, you, you eventually you, you go to the ODE. You want the ODE, ODE to be, uh, uh, there's a truncation because the final solution polynomial. Then you will pick, you will, you will be forced to choose this kind of terms. Okay. And then, of course, there's a natural question. Uh, uh, remember, we have the high dimensional uh, analog of the Kepler problem. We also have a magnetized version of the Kepler problem. So naturally, you say it combines these two. Can we add magnetic charge in high dimension? That's a natural question. And uh, the answer is yes, in dimension phi. And uh, that was done in the 90. 90. And they, in the three, original three dimensions, they use the Dirac manifold. But in this five dimension, they use something called the Young manifold. This Young is a famous CN Young. Uh, who was a faculty member here before. Okay. Uh, he, uh, in the 78, he generalized the Dirac's work to the, to the five dimensional cases. But then I realized that this can be done in any dimension if we use a so called generalized Dirac monopose. Um, because in the early work, they, they thought uh, this existence of a monopole has to do with the division algebra. The Dirac monopole has to do with the compass number. Young monopole has to do with uh, quaternions. But then you, we don't have many uh, division algebra, so they thought we should stop there. But I realized that the whole problem has to do with the spin, which has to do with the cliff algebra. So not, not only in the even di uh, all dimension, like 3 and 5, you can also have spin in the in uh, uh, even dimension. Okay? In any dimension, you can have it. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this problem because I partially I want to justify my, my gen generalized Dirac monopole work to, to make sure this really makes sense. Okay, it turns out everything can be done successfully. Now, is this the end of the story? No, far from it. The clue comes from the following two naive questions. The first one is to find a geometric, geometrically simpler description of the Kepler orbits as a conic. In the original conic, we have three cases. Uh, to me, this is not uh, simple enough. Okay, it's not unified enough. We, we will have an even simpler picture of, of our conic. The next to understand uh, why this SO24 enters into picture. To me, it's a mystery. It turns out these two problems are really related. So first, uh, I will start with the ancient Greek's definition of a conic. So by that definition, a conic is a curve, well, not straight things, it's curved obtained by intersecting a cone with a plane. So here is a picture. Okay, so we are in a three-dimensional space-time. So two-dimensional space, one-dimensional time. And here is the cone. Uh, this is, uh, in two physics, this will be called a future light cone, and this is a past light cone. And if we take any plane, we we'll do the intersection. If we get a curve, that curve will be a conic. Uh, uh, connect to the picture we, we had already, the real means we have to do the projection of this whole thing onto the horizontal plane. Now, that would be the Europe uh, picture of a conics. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, this cone, with this cone point removed, is a smooth space, two-dimensional space. It's a diffeomorphic to R2 minus origin. Okay. Uh, in, uh, because this is really the graph of the function t equal to square root x squared plus y squared. Away from origin, this function is a smooth. So then this description is much simpler and much uniform. Uh, by the way, uh, suppose we take a, a, a plane uh, uh, contains the axis and also this x-axis do the intersection. What do we get? Well, it would be part of like a, a half line. But this half line is really correspond to the colliding trajectory. So this way, you really can get all kinds of trajectory, not, not just the non-colliding. Colliding one, you can also get it. And it's a very uniform description. Just take any plane intersect, you will get an orbit. Now, uh, the actual things, we, uh, actual space time is a four dimensional. In the, in the, four, the, the Minkowski space time. So, so here's uh, my observation. So there's a it's called light cone reformulation. So it is more natural in view of a previous slide. It's more natural to view the Kepler problem as a dynamic problem on the future light cone uh, with the cone point removed. Uh, inside the Minkowski space, space. It's a four-dimensional, three, three plus one-dimensional. Okay? And this explains why SO24 should appear, because this SO24 is the conformal group of this guy, 
well, compatify, conform or compatify. Okay, that is the Lie algebra of this guy X on this. Okay. Now, this new perspective opens more doors for the search of generalized Kepler problem because Minkowski space is just one example of Euclidean Jordan algebras. There are many, many of them. Okay. And so let me remind you the key to the generalization. So just as vector bundles are the natural home settings for characteristic classes, Euclidean Jordan algebra are the natural home setting for the generalized Kepler problems. And moreover, uh, one discovers a more super integral model even if one just sticks to the Minkowski scale space. Okay, let me go back to this uh, picture. I say this future light cone is associated with our original Kepler problem. And there is a piece inside bounded by this future light cone. That thing will be also associated with a super integral model. And that thing is really new. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about the Euclidean Jordan algebra. Uh, first of all, it is a finite dimensional. But we are only interested in the finite dimensional one. Okay. Uh, a finite, it's a finite dimensional real algebra, and it's a commutative, okay, and with a unit, um, such that the following two conditions are satisfied. The first one I call the weakly associative. For associativity, normally we have three elements, A, B, C. The product in two different order always the same. Okay? But here we have A, B, the third element has to be A square. So it's a special kind of associativity. Okay? Um, and the second part is the formula real. For two real numbers, A squared plus B squared equals zero, and both A and B has to be zero. But here we call the formally, formally, because it's just elements. Okay, so A squared plus B squared equals zero implies this. Okay, how do we understand this? Uh, I, one way to, A, B, the generators? Uh, a, B are element in the algebra. Any elements? Yeah, any element. Yeah, not necessarily generators. Yeah. So I would uh, try to say this is a really, uh, Jordan algebra is a really, oh, by the way, if you just stick to property one, they call the Jordan algebra. The probability two uh, gives you Euclidean. Uh, in the old days, people called it formally real. When Jordan Wigner they did the, they did the classification, they called it formally real because this condition is a formally real condition. And why it become Euclidean? Because this is equivalent to another condition, which says uh, this finite dimensional real vector space has a unit product structure there, such that this unit product structure and this Jordan multiplication structure are compatible in the sense that. Comp the multiplication by A is always self-adjoint with respect to the respect, uh, inner product. So this condition is equivalent to that condition. So that's why nowadays people call it the Euclidean Jordan algebra. So uh, I think most of you mathematicians are familiar with uh, Lie algebra. So I will say this is the analog of uh, Lie algebra. In the, in the Lie algebra case, so suppose we talk about real Lie algebra, and there the product is a skew uh, commutative, A, B equal to negative B, A, okay? So I would say it's a super analog of that. And then there, there's a Jacobian identity. It's a replacement for associativity. So here I use this weak associativity, okay? And then, uh, in fact, in the, for the real Lie algebra, there's something called a uh, semi-simple and a compact real Lie algebra. And this is compact and semi-simple part corresponding to the second condition. So in some sense, this Euclidean Jordan algebra is the simplest kind of a Jordan algebra. Just like uh, the semi-simple uh, compact Lie algebra is the simplest Lie algebra, just like that. Okay, it's always semi-simple. By the way, this is condition always implies the semi-simple. Uh, by the way, there is an analog of uh, uh, Cartan killing uh, metric in this case, which is uh, uh, always uh, po positive definite. Okay, so become the inner product. By the, okay, the, so it, it decomposes into a dark sum of simple ones. The simple ones admit invariant inner product, which are unique up to multiplication by a positive uh, number. Okay, now here is a classification. Um, it's in the 30s, done by, uh, by them. Uh, the first one is the collection of all real numbers. But in this case, actually, the algebra is associative. In all other cases, non-associative. And this one is really the uh, Lorentz space. This is the time, this is the space. And what is the product here? 
You take any two things here, the product would be the dot product, will give you a number here. You take a number here, take a vector here, the product would be a scale multiplication, so end up with a vector here. You take any two real number here, you, with multiplication, just the ordinary real number multiplication, end up with element there. And then what is this? This is the n by n real symmetric matrix. And then what is the multiplication? It's the matrix multiplication, but then symmetrized. If we take two a real uh, uh, n by n symmetric matrix, we do the ordinary matrix multiplication, then you end, we end up with, uh, in general, a non-symmetric matrix. But if we symmetrize the product, we end up here. And here, similarly, we take n by n uh, complex Hermitian uh, matrix, and here n by n quaternion Hermitian, here n by 3 by 3 octonian Hermitian. But here we have the n at 3, uh, because if we would go higher, like 4 or 5, then this won't be a Jordan algebra. Of course, we can go back to 2, H2, but that is okay. But then that is isomorphic to R plus R to the 9. So similarly here, I restrict N star from 3, because N equal to 2, each of them is isomorphic to one of the guy here. So this is a complete list. And this one I highlight because this is really the simplest one, and also it's a commute uh, associative. And this one I highlight because this one people called uh, um, exceptional in the following sense. Uh, Jordan algebra, just like uh, Lie algebra, has something called like a universal enveloping algebra. So it has to do with associative algebra. Right? Start with associative algebra, you do anti symmetrization, you get a Lie algebra. And all this has something like that, but except for the last one. The last one is not associated with uh, associative algebra. So that's the difference between Jordan algebra and, uh, and uh, Lie algebra. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, those are uniquely determined by two things. One is called the rank, another is called the degree. Uh, what do I mean by the rank? For this matrix type, the rank is really this n, 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 and this 3. And for this case, by the way, this is really can be viewed as a special case, 1n equal to 1. So in this case, the, n, uh, the rank is 1. For this case, the rank is always equal to 2. Okay. And then there's a something called the degree. The degree in this case, uh, well, it, for n by n matrix, there's an off diagonal entry. The off diagonal entry is a real number, so so it's so it's a one. And here the off diagonal entry is a complex number, so viewed as a two independent real number, so you get two. So degree is two. So similarly, here's a degree four, and this is a degree eight, and the degree here is n minus one. Okay, and so uh, if we uh, any Jordan algebra is uniquely determined by this two. And in the case of rank equal to two, you have infinite many. In the case of rank equal to three, we have four. In the case of rank bigger than three, we have only three. This is something uh, like uh, the regular solids. In two dimensions, we have a triangle, square, right, uh, pentagon, and so on. We have infinite many. But in three dimensions, the platonic solid, we have only five. But in four dimensions, we have something like six. In five dimensions or higher, we have only three. So there's a similarity. I don't know whether they are related or not. Anyway, so this is a complete list. Okay. Now, to me, there is an important thing, uh, which is called TKK construction. So, so named after the three people, they are in, they independently discover this. So basically, to each uh, simple uh, Euclidean Jordan algebra, they can associate, they can construct a, a real, a simple real Lie algebra. Okay. I will uh, start with this uh, introduction of Jordan triple product. So we take three elements, u, v, w, and we take the product. We have, because of the commutativity, we get six, three possibility. And then one of them, you put a negative sign here, you do this combination. Well, the v is in the middle, so here you put a negative sign here. Okay, this is called uh, Jordan triple product. Now, if we fix w, uh, fix u, v, View, view w as a variable, view w as a variable, then we really get uh, endomorphism on this Jordan algebra. Jordan algebra, remember, is a vector space. You map w to this one. And this s, so denoted by s sub u v. And this sub u v for all possible u and v, that span uh, a really algebra called structure, al structure algebra of the Jordan algebra. Uh, because if you do the commutation, uh, 
relation, commutate, form the commutator of any two of them is closed. Okay. But here, uh, we'll look, examine closely. This is Z and the W behave differently. <laughs> uh, remember, we have a canonical inner product on J. So we have vector, we also have covector. But covector, because the inner product, we can identify covector with a vector called W. And uh, this transformation rule says um, this Z should be under the transformation of SUV. This Z behaves like a vector, and the W uh, transform like a covector. And uh, here's the UV, because, uh, because this SUV, if we take the adjoint, will become SVU. But then we have to put a negative sign here in order to get this core joint uh, operation. Okay, so, so Z behaves like a vector, W like, behaves like a covector. Now, this algebra, uh, structure algebra in general is not, well, it's never simple, okay? Uh, mathematically, the simple algebra will be simpler, okay? So they enlarge it, so to make it bigger. So as a vector space, we add one copy of the J and, and one copy of the dual space of J. And then we can introduce a commutation relation such that this become a simple, really algebra, okay? And this commutation relation can, looks like uh, complicated, but actually quite easy to remember. Uh, we, we have the grading. It's a Z. Z uh, has a grading negative one. The structural group, uh, this is like angular momentum, has a dimension zero. This is like, like a space time. It's a dimension negative one. This is like momentum, has a dimension positive one. So the degree one, negative one, degree zero, and degree positive one. And this commutator should preserve the degree. So for example, two negative one, together should be degree negative two, but there's no degree two term has to be zero. Degree negative two term, so it has to be zero. Similarly here, has to be zero. Here, this is degree one, a negative one, this is degree one, so together should be degree zero. Now degree zero should be come from here, so some SUV. Uh, why precisely this? Because the U behave like a vector, and the V behave like, like a covector. But by the way, element, uh, element here can be identified with the inner product with a W. Okay, anyway. So it has, then the only thing not fixed is this normalization. So uh, we don't want to choose to be zero. If choose a zero, it's not simple algebra. Well, we choose to be negative two. And this xz behave like this because uh, z is a vector, and this z behave like a covector. So and the SUV will become like this, and this is the original one. So it's quite easy to, to get this. Uh, by the way, this all has a geometric meaning uh, because this simple, uh, uh, this real geo Jordan algebra has to do with the symmetric domain of tube type. The simplest one, you take a real number as our Jordan algebra, uh, the, the symmetric domain will be upper half plane. And it's a conformal equivalent to the uh, Poincare disk. And then uh, what would be the, this uh, Jord, uh, um, com uh, conformal algebra? Conformal algebra in this case, well, there is a group here. Basically, the, the biholomorphic automorphism group of the upper half plane, and then you take the Lie algebra, you get this conformal algebra. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the Minkowski space-time uh, case, this structural group is the, really the Lorentz uh, Lie algebra plus the dilation, scaling. And this J is like a translation, and this J star is like a special conformal transformation. So altogether, this is a conformal Lie algebra of, okay, in this case. Anyway, uh, oops. Uh oh. What happened? I don't know why. <laughs> or, or not enough enough electricity? Lights on, right? Uh, the battery may be dying. Oh, battery die. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. And then uh, I should have uh, another battery. Uh, uh oh. Oh. Battery. I changed to a new battery. Oh, maybe, maybe I just use my, yours. Yeah. Okay.
Oh, OK. Uh, what is this highlight? It's not good. Can you see the highlight? No. No. That's the problem with the highlight. Oh, OK. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, I have this, uh, uh, this is called a derivation. Uh, this is really, uh, for any Jordan algebra, there is something called automorphism group of this Jordan algebra. And takes the algebra, and it's this. For the Minkowski space time, this is SO3, our rotation group algebra. And this is the structure group, is really the Lorentz group, plus this is dilation. And the conformal algebra is really SO4, comma 2. Okay. And this, there is something called a K, uh, because after all, this has some, some group there. And the group has something called a maximum compact subgroup. And for that group, I take it's a universal covering. The universal covering would be like this. Okay. So in the, in the simplest case, this would be SL2R. And the, then the, the maximum compact group would be uh, well, the connected one, well, SL. So it's SO2. SO2, you take the universal covering, it would be R. It's something like this. OK. OK. Um, now, now I, I want to talk about the generalized Kepler problem. So I will break this construction into two parts. And the first part is the algebraic. There is something called a universal Kepler problem. Just like in the vector bundle or characteristic classes, there is a universal bundle, universal classes. OK. And the second part is the quantization of a conformal algebra. I will tell you what I mean uh, uh, in the next slides. And in the first part, we write down the universal Hamiltonian in terms of a generator of uh, conformal algebra. And also, I will write down uh, uh, the universal uh, lens vector in terms of the generator of conformal algebra. In the second part, we describe a geometric realization for the unitary lowest weight modules. Okay? And so once we have a geometric realization, then elements of the conformal algebra would be expressed as a differential operator. Then you plug it into this universal Hamiltonian relation. Then you will get differential operators for the Hamiltonian, okay, instead of abstract operator, uh, abstract elements in the conformal algebra. So combining these two parts, we get a generalized capital problem for each non-trivial unitary lowest weight module. By the way, uh, uh, so-called unitary lowest weight module uh, the first one who studied, well, uh, in the begin this has to do with the Princeton. The Bachmann studied this in for SL2R, and uh, then Gerfan studied for SL2. Oh, well, for unitary high weights, I don't have it. SL2R, the Bachmann, okay. And then the Harish Chandra here, the faculty member here, and uh, he in the 50s he he, dis uh, he he found something called a holomorphic discrete series, and uh, it's a, a unitary lowest weight module y y for for the group I'm talking about. And then he asked, can we, f can we uh, find uh, all of them, the class of them? So this would be called the Harajandra problem in the 55. Uh, in the 50s, nobody cares about it. In the 60s, nobody cares about it. And in the middle of the 70s, people start to study it. I guess probably because there's a, there was a need to, to study representation in the 70s. And then towards the end of 70s, or by the uh, early 80s, people manage to classify this. Okay. So, so, so I would say if we do the capital problem, suppose we don't know the result there, eventually we, we will arrive at the same conclusion. We discover, rediscover the things they found in the 70s. Okay. So essentially say for each non-trivial, well, there's a trivial one. Trivial one, we don't have a model. For each non-trivial one, there will be a cap general capital problem model. Okay. Now, first, the algebraic part is much easy. Uh, the universal Hamiltonian is like this. Uh, I cannot highlight. Um, but remember, in the conformal algebra, we have SUV, we have XU, and also YZ, right? And the U and the Z, those are elements of the Jordan algebra. But our Jordan algebra has a, a special element called the identity element, E. So for this identity element, E, there's XE, there's also YE. Suppose I formally invert ye and write it as ye to the negative one. Okay? Then, the, then we write this universal Hamiltonian like that. And the universal lens vector would be like that. Okay? If we take the special one, like a, a, a Minkowski space time, you plug in, you will get precise the things we have. Okay? By the way, uh, in this case, if we would take u equal to e, 
the AE would be like one. That's a trivial one. But what's the non-trivial one is those U, which is perpendicular to E. That that be the non-trivial one. Uh, that's why uh, length of vector uh, in the original case is a vector in R3, not in vector in R4, because the fourth component is always one. Okay. Now they satisfy this commutation relation, so we will call the length algebra. Okay. So the first, this part essentially says this LUV is like a generator of ro rotations. So this Hamiltonian is a rotational environment in original cases. And this really says the length vector is a conserved quantity. By the way, how do we compute this? Because we know the commutation relation between X and Y and SUV, things like that. You just, and remember YE inverse is the formal inverse. You just remember that, and then you can compute. And this really says the rotational algebra relation. And this really says this AZ is a vector into rotation. And then this is last one is a really non-trivial one. Okay. And we have similar things in the original case. Now, this is universal algebraic relation. Now, what do you mean by quantization of a conformal algebra? So by quantization of a conformal algebra, we really mean realizing the elements in the conformal algebra as anti hermitian operators on L2 space of function on certain Riemannian manifold. Uh, I say anti Hermitian because we are mathematicians. Physics usually want Hermitian. Okay. Um, uh, I put a twist there because I allow the case you have vector bundles. Then you talk about the section. The section of vector bundle called twisted functions. Okay. Uh, it turns out for each integer k between 1 and the row, row is the rank. Remember, I introduced the rank notation. Uh, there is a such manifold, C, uh, denoted by CK. Uh, then how about rank over 0? Rank over 0 is really the, the origin. That really corresponds to the trivial representation, which is not interesting. Okay, we don't. So as a smooth space, so what is a CK? CK consists of precisely all non-negative elements of rank K. Say we take the Jordan algebra to be n by n real symmetric matrix, and each, each of these matrices can be diagonalized, okay, and rotation. And then uh, the uh, suppose I talk about non non-negative elements. That means the eigenvalue will be either positive or zero, right? And then the number of non-negative uh, eigenvalue will be the rank of that of the matrix. Okay, so I put these elements together. It turns out they are smooth space. Okay, actually, they are they are a structure group homogeneous invariant. By, by the way, they're structure algebra, and it has a something called structure group. And each of these CK is a structure group X on it, and and it is a single orbit, so it's a homogeneous space. And since it's a subspace of uh, Euclidean Jordan algebra, and Euclidean Jordan algebra is a, a Euclidean space, so it's also a submanifold of Euclidean space J. However, I say this CK should be a Riemannian manifold in order to do geometry. Okay. So what are, what are the right matrix we need to put on? Uh, the right matrix turns out to be neither the homogeneous one, homogeneous with respect to STR, and nor the induced Euclidean matrix. Uh, in order to define the matrix, we have to use a Jordan modification. Okay. But in any case, this, this matrix, uh, I will call it Kepler matrix, is an invariant and automorphism group of the Jordan algebra. Because, because this Jordan modification is invariant and, and uh, automorphism group. Okay. And then, uh, in order to get the formula nice, uh, the, the integration measure we should choose to be the volume. The, once we have matrix, remember we have volume form. But then we have the rescale by one over trace. Trace is just ordinary trace for the matrix. Okay, one over the trace of this. Okay, this trace is never zero because the rank is at least one. Okay. Now, I should talk about the simplest example. Okay, namely the Jordan algebra is R. So in this case, the rank is one. Uh, the non-trivial k has to be one. So there's only one uh, c k, namely c one. And the C1 should be the positive element, namely the collection of all positive real numbers from zero, so I call it I plus, so from zero to infinity. Okay. In this case, the conformal algebra is SL2R, and we, ha we don't have the rotational part, structural part. Uh, uh, we, but we have this uh, so-called, uh, no, uh, we, we do have the structure part. The structure part is only the dilation, this S, S is the dilation. Is really the Euler operator, and then we have x and, and y. The only non-trivial one is x e and y e, and that satisfies this relation. And this relation is precisely the the relation, uh, uh, commutative relation for generator of S O two R. Now, 
this generator will be geometrically realized as a linear operator on this Hilbert space. As we know, this uh, differential operator cannot act on all of them. So you have, we have to choose a, a domain of a definition. Okay? Uh, because I, I say this commutation relation should be closed, there must be a common domain of definition. And this, this domain has to be dense. Okay? So we can choose one like this. So, well, oh, first of all, it can be realized like this. The, this one is really the Euler operator, degree operator, up to a sign. And this y is really multiplicated by a negative imaginary unit i times x. And this non-trivial one is this one. Okay? Remember, here, nu is a quadratic in nu, so there is a symmetry. For two different nu, you could end up with the same thing. But then, uh, as I say, we have to choose a common dense domain of definition for these three differential operators. So it can be chosen like this. So the x to the nu over 2. Uh, by the way, x is a positive, so this is a well-defined. Okay? So this is expansion negative x, and this is arbitrary polynomial in x. And one can check that this is a dense it is a common domain of definition, and it's a dense if and only if nu is a positive real number. And by the way, for two, uh, there's a symmetry between nu equal to one. Nu equal to one is, is symmetric. But then it looks like uh, for two, two, two nu uh, has equal distance from one, you should have the same operator. But it's not, because the domain of definition are different. Okay. Oh, now, next page, I will have it. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the, here's basically the representation part. So, so let me quickly go through. Then the next page, I will have it. Okay, so I say it's not hard to see that this operator, a Hermitian operator on this d nu, for when nu is in, in uh, zero to infinity. Therefore, for each nu, we have a distinct uni unitary module on SL2R. Okay, uh, one can show that this is really the lowest weight module GK module, uh, and K is really the Lie group uh, whose Lie algebra is spanned by this Xe plus Ye. And then the theorem uh, Harris general says whenever you have GK module, you can integrate to the group. So, so in the end, this pi nu, uh, this Hilbert space, is really uh, give us all possible unitary lowest weight representation of, of this group. This means the universal cover of SL2R. Okay. Uh, there is a classification theorem, and you compare the result, you know, you get all of them. Okay. Now, I come to your question. So, consequently, for each nu equals this, but remember we have this, uh, uh, we have this h equal to that. But well, now we realize this as a differential <laughs> operator, this as a differential operator, then you just plug in. And uh, similarly, you plug in here, so we will get an answer. So for each new between zero and infinity, there's a generalized Kepler problem whose Hamiltonian is like this. But then we want to solve the bound state spectrum problem. It turns out the bound state spectrum is like this. This i is a, runs from zero, one, two, okay? And this new over two, new, remember, is a positive. So this never zero, okay? So the spectrum is like this. And moreover, uh, being a closed subspace of, because when we solve this problem, our Hilbert space, uh, the wave function it really lives here. So it's different from the other one, okay? Uh, but then uh, our Hilbert space, uh, uh, bound state, is really a subspace of that. And it is isometric to this one, so it provides another, I say, another realization. Earlier, for purely representation, we know there's a realization by this one, but now we have a different realization. And that really means we have two kinds of uh, uh, orthogonality condition for, for uh, Laguerre polynomial, and people know that. The one is from math mathematics. By definition, they are apply grand schmidt process. You produce this uh, 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 Laguerre polynomial, so automatically they're orthogonal. Another one is you rescale the argument according to the energy level. That's from quantum mechanics textbook. Uh, I know some people wrote a paper about this, say, under certain condition, that's the only two orthogonality conditions we, we can have. We don't have the third one. Anyway, so this is a simple example. Then what about the general picture? Okay. So here's the general picture. Okay. For each new in the W, this W stands for Wallach, because it's Wallach that first discovered this kind of set from the representation theory point of view. Uh, so this W, first of all, there's a discrete part. It starts from D over 2, then twice of D over 2, and then three times D over 2, up to rule minus 1 multiple of D over 2. 
And then after that, there's a continuous part. Okay. So there's a discrete part at equal distance. Okay. Uh, for each new in here, there is a generalized capital problem whose bound state spectrum will be like this. Okay, very similar. Uh, but here, remember, there's a row here. In the old case, the row equal one in the previous simple example. Uh, this really exhausts all unitary lowest wave representation uh, of scalar type. Now, how do we get the so-called other type, so-called vector type? We need to introduce magnetic charge. So by adding magnetic charge, many more general capital problems are obtained, precisely one for each unitary lowest wave representation of the conformal group. Okay. Uh, let me show you the Hamiltonian without adding magnetic charges. Okay. Remember, uh, on the CK, CK is a Riemannian manifold with a, some kind of funny metric on it. And so we can write down the Laplace operator here. And this is the euro inverse square part. But in general, we have to need to add these terms. Okay. And since the K, fr fr K is a discrete, okay, that corresponds to a discrete point in the Wallach set. But then the Wallach starts from somewhere. The Wallach has a continuous parameter. Uh, that is because in the, in the case k equal to rho, C, the full run case, that people call a symmetric cone. There, are any elements in the symmetric cone is an invertible element. You, you, you can talk about its inverse. And once you have this inverse, you can use this inverse to continue to deform it. You can def continue the deformation. So you can see from this capital problem, you can precisely see what like things, the parameters. Okay. And then there's a complicated part. This is a Laplace operator. This D means exterior differential operator. This, uh, this norm means a uh, norm with respect to the, the Riemannian metric we have. And then there's a, this a funny function called phi. Uh, the phi is a, a little bit complicated, but we know it's an automorphic J invariant, rational function on J. You have poles. But then it's always a positive on CK. And this phi, phi actually depends on K. Okay. Is this, are these uh, operators acting on functions on L2R? L2 of the CK. Oh, the CK. CK. L2 of the CK. Sorry, what, what is the CK again? Uh, CK uh, means a collection of positive elements with rank K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The original Kepler problem corresponds to K equal to 1 case, so the extreme end, K equal to 1. The, the holomorphic discrete case corresponds to K equal to uh, full rank case. So historically, the Hiroshima in the other end, full rank case. And the hydrogen atom give you the other extremes, the smallest rank case. But then in between, well, in older people are not connected to each other. Okay. Then there's a representation theory of people doing the analytic continuation, start from Hiroshima, do analytic continuation. They have it. But, but some of the things, they are not explicit. For example, uh, they know there is some mirror supported on this small CK. Abstractly. But in my case, on this CK, I have Riemannian metric. I use a volume form and a plus this row function, a uh, fee function. I can write down the mirror precisely. So the geometric is more refined. Plus, I have dynamics. You can talk about trajectory here. Okay. Um, so, but I, I don't, it took me uh, a few months to work out of these additional terms. Uh, I don't have a geometric meaning. Well, say, I, I don't have conceptual understanding why this term should appear. OK, I just say the make the original work. So it, so it becomes things like that. OK, I have five more minutes. So I, I will um, summarize or, or make a comment, final comment. So I say uh, the natural extension of the capital problem, I hope you are convinced, OK? Uh, the, in, the enrich is already very rich mathematics surrounding the symmetric domain. The symmetric domain, the simplest one is the upper half plane. For each of these Jordan algebra, there's corresponding symmetric domain of tube type associated to it. Okay? And, uh, and that gives us a new vantage point to re-examine Raj House uh, theta correspondence and the unitary lowest weight module. So what is theta correspondence? Okay, I, I want to mention there's a correspondence here. Remember, we need to add magnetic charge. Once we add magnetic charge, we have a new model. Then we have the Hilbert space bound state. That will be a representation of the non-compact conformal group. But what is magnetic charge in mathematics? Magnetic charge in mathematics, we have to choose a gauge group, which is a compact group, and choose a irreducible representation. So therefore, we have correspondence between representation of a compact group 
and a representation, even a dimensional representation of a non-compact group. So there is this correspondence. When this group things overlap with the house correspondence case, they agree. It's precise as how correspondence. But there are cases which they do not overlap. So you, you might say this is a generalized set, set of correspondence. So, so there's a magnetic charge and a hyperspace bound state correspondence. That is precisely generalization, well, overlap with a set of correspondence. And the unitary loss weight representation, which I mentioned the other side. I, 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 I came to here, I heard some general talk about Lenland's correspondence. They also have some s s similar spirit. There's a Galois representation, finite dimension representation, and then the other side, infinite dimension automorphic representation. And here is also like that. Of course, it's much simpler. Uh, and then they provide a baby example for such concept in physics as, as a duality, anomaly, and anomaly cancellation. So what do I mean by anomaly? Uh, in physics, we know classically we have the symmetry. The model depends on a certain parameter. So when we do quantum mechanics, in general, the symmetry won't be preserved unless the parameter be readjusted. Okay? So if you choose a special parameter, the symmetry recover, then we have the symmetry uh, cancellation. So in our Kepler case, the magnetic charge is a, is a representation of a compact group. Uh, this compact group has many, many representations. If you randomly choose one, it won't work. You have to choose certain special one. Then anomaly cancel. Then you have this beautiful model quantum mechanics. Okay. Then what do I mean by as a duality? So there's an anomaly cancellation uh, uh, corresponds to those fractional uh, values that you have, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but yeah. at other values, you won't work. It won't work. You won't work. The algebra doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. And as a duality, it is a really strong and weak duality. Uh, this is really, so I would say the Fox, this from Soviet Union, uh, Fox work is the first example of as duality, although we don't say it that way. Uh, first, as duality in, well, there's as duality in topology, basically the generalization of Alexander duality. But the as duality in, in the physics first appeared in the gauge theory and the string theory. Basically, say you have two quantum mechanical systems. Uh, each of them is an interaction system. There's a coupling constant there, and they're isomorphic quantum mechanically. And when you do the isomorphism, you realize if the coupling constant here is small, then the other side will be bigger, something like that. And in the one side, uh, there's, a, there's a hidden symmetry. The actual symmetry is bigger, but it's a hidden. But on the other side, this, that, that same amount of symmetry is explicit. Okay. Now back to the Kepler problem. Why uh, um, Fox work is like that? Uh, Fock really say, be, because uh, uh, historically we know there's SO4 symmetry and through algebra, and the Fock say, I'm not satisfied with this. I want to see it explicitly, how to see it geometrically, okay, manifestly. And then he, say, he solved the shooting problem by doing the Fourier transform and so go to the momentum space and do some compactification. It, it's not straightforward. There, there is a certain technique, a technical part, okay? So, so if I uh, later on Moser, the dynamic system, I guess, uh, he, he realized the classical picture. So if I use the classical picture, essentially it really says this. For the Kepler bound state, bound orbit problem, that is equivalent to uh, start with a, a three-dimensional sphere with radius r. Obviously, there's SO4 symmetry, right? We take a random metric on it. And then you take the geodesic motion. Then obviously, there's SO4 symmetry. And that dynamics is equivalent to our Kepler dynamics. Uh, integral and also integrable, yes, yes, because uh, the, the sphere is really a uh, symmetric space, yeah, okay. And so, so, so maybe uh, you ask me, uh, for integral system, people talk about R matrix things, uh, which I never studied that, but I realized that there are two kinds of integral system. Uh, one type is uh, you start with a so-called symmetric space, G mod K. Then you do the projection over to, the, down to the, Double coset space, G over K, this side over K, the other side. You, the shadow here is an integral system. For that kind of things, we do have a R matrix. And for this kind of a super integral model, I realize there's an duality here. Basically, say, again, you start with a uh, symmetric space. Uh, you do, classically, you do geodesic motion. It's very nice. But then you do something like a duality, and sort of Fourier general. Gen uh, Fourier transform, then see other side. The symmetry become hidden, but it's still there. So the Kepler problem is this type. Okay. Um, so finally, 
I want to say they have interesting connection to algebraic geometry and perhaps even to numbers and fundamental physics. Why to algebraic geometry? In the simplest case, we have this simplest curve, conics. Even in the k equal to 1 case, if we go to other Jordan algebra, it won't be a plain curve. I don't know what it is. So in general, all these curves, uh, I, I know, uh, sh should, be, should be algebraic because the intersection of lots of equations because uh, the, the first of this cone set up this algebraic relation and also this uh, length factor, you set equal to some constant, you set up algebraic equation. Okay. So what are those curves? I have no idea. I haven't, I haven't investigated. And why to, even to number theory? I suspect because, the, uh, by the way, uh, in, uh, from physical background, I know there are two nice models in the physical textbook. One is a harmonic oscillator. The other is this Kepler problem. Looks like they're different. But in my, this formulation, the harmonic oscillator, isotropic harmonic oscillators in dimension n, is really a generalized Kepler problem here, associated to hn of r with k equal to 1 case, and scalar type case. So harmonic oscillator is a special type of general Kepler problem. And, and I know in the, in the 60s, Andrew Wei had a two paper, long paper, relating the, this harmonic oscillator to theta functions. So presumably, but now the, this oscillator is just a special case of that. Presumably that work can be generalized. Uh, I say fundamental physics because I have speculation. Because uh, in the k equal to 1 case, in each case I have magnetic charge. But in the last exceptional case, mathematically you are not allowed to have magnetic charge. But in our world, we don't have magnetic charge observed. So if you want to try to give a theoretical explanation, I say maybe we're in the exceptional case, space time case, which means 27 dimensional. Okay, uh, that's purely speculation. Okay, so I, my talk ends here. Thank you. Thanks for your attention.